Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Ethel Kedia, and this is my colleague, Gaushang. And we are going to be talking about tuning Apache Spark for large scale workload. In this presentation, on a high level, we'll talk about the nature and scale of Spark workload at Facebook. Then we'll talk in detail about uh, some critical configuration tuning and optimization we make to various components of Spark in order to scale for our workload. Then we'll talk about some application-specific configuration tuning. And lastly, we'll highlight some tools which we use to find performance bottleneck in, in our Spark jobs. In Facebook, we use Spark to run large-scale batch workload. So in this presentation, the configuration tuning and optimization you are going to hear about are mainly focused on large-scale batch workload. And they might not be uh, applicable for other use cases like streaming or interactive or maybe small workloads. To give you a sense of scale at which we operate, we run tens of thousands of jobs every day on compute machines sp spanning thousands of nodes. In terms of single job scalability, we are able to scale Spark to run workload, which processes hundreds of terabytes of compressed input data and shuffle data, and can run hundreds of thousands of tasks. Of course, uh, running Spark on such a large scale does not work right off the bat. We need to make various configuration tuning and optimization to various components of Spark, like driver, executor, and the shuffle service in order to run the job scalably. Before we talk about those uh, optimization, I want to point out that uh, all the improvements we are going to be talking about here uh, are already present in open source Spark, or they, some of them are under review, so the community can benefit from them. Let's talk about scaling the Spark driver. The Spark driver is an entity which hosts the Spark context. It coordinates with the cluster manager to launch executors on the cluster, and it schedules tasks on the uh, cluster. So it becomes obvious that while running jobs, uh, which can uh, run thousands of tasks, the Spark driver becomes the bottleneck. So let's talk about some configuration tuning we uh, do for Spark driver to scale. First is uh, enabling dynamic executor allocation. The dynamic executor allocation is a feature which enables a Spark job to add and remove executors on the fly. As compared to the traditional static resource allocation where we have to request and reserve resources beforehand, the dynamic executor allocation, you get how much resources you need and not more. So for example, if the task queue in the scheduler piles up, then the uh, driver talks to the cluster manager to spawn more and more executors on the cluster. And when the task queue decreases and uh, the uh, executors are idle, the driver coordinates with the cluster manager to release the idle executors. This is really helpful for multi-tenant environment where the cluster resources are shared uh, across multiple jobs and users. And in those cases, you should enable dynamic executor allocation to get a better resource utilization and uh, uh, fair resource uh, allocation across multiple jobs. Apart from simply enabling the dynamic executor allocation, there are certain other configurations like uh, the minimum executors, maximum executors, and the executor idle timeout, which you should tune based on your nature of the workload and the scale. The Spark scheduler architecture is uh, event-driven in the sense that the scheduler, uh, scheduler generates events uh, for example, task start event, task end event, and different components of the driver uh, inter implement the interface to listen for those events and take action based on that. The event processor 
currently is a single threaded uh, entity which uh, loops through all the listeners and processes those events synchronously. Well, learning jobs uh, running multiple uh, many tasks in parallel, producing large number of event, we found out that the single threaded architecture of the event processor can easily become the bottleneck. And the event processing latency can be up to several minutes. This is really bad for uh, uh, performance of the job as well as it, it might, uh, in the worst case, fail the job. So we made a change to multi-thread the event processor where we have a dedicated queue and a thread per, e per event listener and the event processing latency went down from several minutes to in the order of few milliseconds for our large jobs. Please note that this uh, pull request is still under review in the open source and we expect to get it uh, soon in the, uh, in the master. Next, uh, better fetch failure handling. While running uh, jobs at a scale, we, this is one of the major issue we observed is uh, uh, inefficient fetch failure handling in Spark driver. When the size of the cluster increases, the chances of encountering failures uh, like uh, uh, network timeout, node reboot, or shuffle service restart increases. And as a result, your chances of encountering any fetch failure. Unfortunately, the Spark driver is not robust enough to handle all kind of fetch failure. We can see a classic example of this is we were seeing one single fetch failure was causing multiple retries of a, of a stage, which is not desirable. This not only increases the latency for the job, it also fails, can fail the job because the maximum number of fetch failure that, has, that is currently allowed is four. This is due to a bug in the scheduler which uh, was not running all the map tasks needed in case of fetch failure. We fixed the issue and our jobs were much st stable after uh, this change in case of fetch failure. Apart from that, uh, we also improved the scheduler logic to handle various fetch failure scenarios, which I'm not gonna talk about in detail, but you can uh, refer to the open source Jira to know more about them. One thing I want to highlight is uh, the maximum number of fetch failures which was uh, hard-coded to four, we have made it configurable. And in case in your environment you are encountering many fetch failures and job failure because of them, then you can bump it off uh, to uh, stabilize your jobs. Next is uh, tuning for the RPC server threads. While run, running jobs uh, at scale, we observed that the driver was frequently ooming. Looking into the driver heap dump, we found, the, found out that there is a huge backlog of RPC requests built on the driver. And the RPC requests were uh, consuming uh, most of the driver memory. The default number of RPC server thread, which is set to eight, is just too low for running large jobs. And uh, in case of uh, many events are generated uh, in parallel, then this RPC server can easily get backlogged. So you can try increasing the number of threads and that might help get rid of OOM and jobs might run stably. Let's talk about scaling the Spark executor. One of the major challenge we face while scaling the Spark executor is executor OOM failing the job. So proper memory configuration for Spark job is very crucial to running the jobs reliably. Before talking about the specific memory configuration, it is important for us to understand the memory layout of the executor. As we can see, the executor memory is divided into four uh, sections called uh, shuffle memory, user memory, reserve memory, and the memory buffer. Out of these four sections, the most interesting are for us are shuffle memory and the user memory, and we should work towards tuning them. 
The shuffle memory is used to buffer the shuffle internal data structure. In, uh, when the map task is running, as it reads more and more, and more data, it stores those data into the shuffle memory. And as you run out of the shuffle memory, uh, the buffered data is spilled to disk. So in theory, if you increase the shuffle memory, then you can avoid spilling often to disk, and that will uh, speed up your job. The user memory, on the other hand, is used for user-specific data structure. And how much user memory to allocate, it totally depends on application. The shuffle memory and user memory, these are both configurable by one configuration, Spark memory fraction. And by default, 40% of the uh, executor memory is allocated to the user memory. In case your application doesn't need that much of user memory, then you can actually bump up the shuffle memory, uh, Spark memory fraction so that you can trade the user memory for shuffle memory and, uh, and uh, avoid frequent spill to disk, which will increase the performance of your job. OK, now you have tuned your uh, Spark memory fraction. Uh, what else can you do to speed up your job? You can actually enable OFIF uh, memory uh, for uh, Spark. What OFIF memory does is it enables you to allocate the shuffle data structure OFIF in native memory, which means that they are not allocated or managed by JVM's memory manager. And so they are not subjected to garbage collection. So you, by enabling shuffle uh, off heap memory, you can actually avoid garbage collection overhead for the shuffle data structure, which will help you speed up your job. Third configuration for memory management we found is uh, tuning for garbage collection. The shuffle internals allocates large large contiguous in-memory buffers. And this uh, frequent allocation of large contiguous buffer actually is, uh, does not play well for some uh, garbage collectors like G1GC. We found out that G1GC suffers from uh, fragmentation uh, because uh, if the size of the object is more than the region size, which is 32 MB. So you can uh, switch to parallel GC instead of G1JC to avoid any OOM due to memory fragmentation. Next, uh, let's talk about tuning for disk I.O. Before talking about tuning for disk I.O., we should know where Spark actually does disk I.O. As discussed previously, the shuffle memory is used for storing uh, intermediate shuffle rows. As the map task reads more and more rows, the size of the shuffle memory, the buffer for the shuffle memory increases. And as you hit the limit, uh, the data is sorted and spilled to disk. A map task can actually produce several such intermediate spill files in disk, which are later read from disk and merged to produce the final shuffle output on disk. Since the disk access can be in the order of 100,000 times slower than memory access, the disk I.O. which happens during spill and shuffle can become the performance bottleneck for the jobs. You might think that your data is small enough to fit in memory, so you don't uh, need to care about uh, disk tuning. But that, that's not entirely true, because even if your data is small enough and you can avoid spilling to disk, the final shuffle output has to be written to disk. So it's become vital for even for small jobs to tune the uh, disk I.O. performance for a better performance. Fortunately, the buffer sizes used by shuffle and spill are already configurable. But the default size of 32 KB does, is just too small uh, for, uh, for large jobs. We recommend 
to increase the sizes to in the order of few MB to amortize the disk cost and uh, speed up the jobs. Even after configuring the uh, buffer sizes for disk IO, we found out that the spill merge process was still taking a lot of time. The reason for that being, uh, the default spill merge process does not do a buffered read and write. So you can change to a buffered spill merge pro process by uh, disabling spark.file transfer to equals false. And the buffered spill merge process will actually read multiple partitions in memory and buffer them and uh, merge, uh, merge the partitions and uh, store the output in memory and uh, flush to disk if the buffer size increases. And the buffer size used uh, for the spill merge is also configurable and the default size of course is too small. You can try increasing the buffer size uh, for better performance. Third part of uh, tuning for disk IO is uh, compression block size tuning. We found out that the default compression size used by Spark is suboptimal, and you can actually cut down the size of the shuffle and spill as much as by 20% by increasing the uh, block size for compression from 32 KB to 512 KB. Apart from this, we also made various uh, memory leak fixes and improvement to Spark Executor, which I'm not gonna talk about uh, over here, but you can refer to the open source Jira to know more about them. Lastly, let's talk about scaling the Spark uh, external shuffle service. Well, running jobs which can, which can shuffle hundreds of terabytes of data it's uh, easy to see that the shuffle service becomes the bottleneck. We, we were observing that our large job were spending as much as 50% of the time uh, trying to read the shuffle file. Profiling the shuffle service, we found out that it's spending significant time reading the index file from disk. The shuffle uh, data produced by a map task is uh, split into two files, index file and the data file as shown in the figure. The data file actually contains the data which is consumed by the reducer and the index file acts as a dictionary to look up into the data file. Typical shuffle read involves reading both the index file and the data file. So let's take an example how the shuffle read happens. Uh, let's say we have two reducers and they want to read uh, the sh uh, shuffle data from one shuffle service. So the reducer one issues a shuffle fetch, the shuffle service goes, reads the index file and finds the offset and uh, reads the data file, sends the data back. Then reducer two issues a shuffle fetch, the shuffle service again goes, reads the index file finds the corresponding offset and reads the data and sends the data back. We can see that the index file is being read over and over. And we made a change to cache the index file instead. And after our change, we can see that when the first reducer issues a shuffle fetch, the shuffle service reads and caches the index file. So the next time reducer two issues a shuffle fetch, the shuffle service does not have to read the index file from disk. It just uses the caches uh, content in memory and uh, uh, sends the data back. So in this way, you can actually save one disk IO operation per shuffle fetch. Of course, uh, one mapper produces one index file and when you have thousands of mappers running, then there will be thousands of index files. And you do not have memory to cache all the index files. So we use the LRU cache, which, uh, which is used uh, to evict the unused index files. And uh, depending on, your size, on the size of your workload, 
and the amount of shuffle uh, memory ever used by the shuffle service, you can tune the LRU cache size to increase the cache hit rate and uh, 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 speed of your shuffle fetch. Apart from this, there are several uh, few other configuration we find uh, useful to tune for shuffle service, mainly the number of worker thread and backlog, and uh, the shuffle registration timeout and retry. We often observe that the shuffle service becomes unresponsive when it is uh, transferring large amount of shuffle data, and tuning, increasing the worker thread and backlog, and the registration timeout retry helps us uh, recover from those transient issues. That's it from my side on uh, talking about uh, scaling different components of Spark. But uh, if you are interested, you can read about more about it on our blog post on scaling Spark. Next, I'll hand over to my colleague uh, to talk about application tuning and tools. Hello, everyone. So, um, my colleagues said how just talk about the turning large Spark workload from the system perspective. So I'm going to switch gear a little bit to talk about performance turning and the turnings from the application point of view. So uh, my name is uh, Gao Xiang. I'm a software engineer in the ads infrastructure team. So uh, ads team is a large uh, user for the Spark in Facebook. We have been running a lot of um, large and medium-sized workloads in the Spark cluster. And the first experience I want to share from the user's perspective is about the autom automatic turning the parameters for some of the um, key configs of the Spark. So, so why do we want to do this? And there are primarily two motivations. The first, from our customer's perspective, we care about the latency of the critical jobs, of course, and the same amount of resources. Um, because we want to make sure our critical workloads um, meet the SLA criteria um, um, instead of violating it. And, from, and the second motivation is to, about the usability of the Spark. So as a, especially for the new user of the Spark, a user may be get confused um, by um, a lot of the Spark parameters, so that when the first time they try the Spark engine, they cannot get optimal performance compared to their previous experience, for example, using Hive or Presto, uh, et cetera. So we want to eliminate the number of manual turnings as much as possible to achieve comparable job performance with uh, manual turned parameters. So, that's the reason why we have an auto-turning of the MIPER and um, reducer or partitioner, whatever you call it. So the basic idea is that we think that for a large workload, so if the job is granted too few number of MIPER and partitioners, it will take forever for the job to finish. But on the flip side, if the job has been granted too many number of MIPER and reducers, then it will overload the cluster. It will increase a lot of burden to the cluster, which may take over the whole class and block other people's job. And it may also um, increase the burden to the external shuffle service. So, so we, we have found that in, in general, um, the number of mappers and number of reducers are roughly proportional to your input table size. Um, so this is not a, a catch-all solution, but we do find it practical for a lot of use cases. And so we developed a heuristic-based approach based on the table input size. And also we cap the maximum number of map and reducers and the minimum to make sure it neither overloads the cluster, uh, and in the meanwhile, it guarantees the minimum amount of resources. So currently, this feature is being rolled out into the, all the production jobs in Facebook in the Spark cluster. And it has been used to onboard uh, new Spark user cases, uh, as well as migrating, auto-migrating existing 
um, Hive queries um, from the Hive to Spark automatically to have a better performance and CPU reservation time. Um, next, I'm going to show a little bit about uh, the tools we have been used to debug the Spark job. So some are tools may not specific to Facebook, but we still talk about it here, and some are um, Facebook-specific tools. So the first two is, uh, is not Facebook-specific, but we do find the Spark UI metrics to be very useful to kind of break down uh, each of the uh, stages to see where the time is being spent on average and on the P99. So it will give the user um, a rough idea why their job is so. Um, the second two I'm going to talk about is a flame graph. So we have a service that periodically just stack the stack trace on the worker node, and we aggregate the, uh, the, the, the metrics and dump it to uh, one of our internal tools called uh, Scuba. So Scuba is an Facebook internal tool that is used for uh, real do real-time metrics and uh, uh, aggregation and breakdown uh, so that user could slice and dice into the Scuba data set to find um, how their job is performing in real time. So we find that by utilizing this tool, it will make the user easier to find where are the, um, where are the hot spots of the CPU. So, um, for example, sometimes the bottleneck might be some user-defined uh, UDFs, and we use this tool to find the bottleneck, and we find there is a, some bug in the UDF, and we go and fix it. Um, and last but not least, uh, it's also, um, we have built um, a couple of monitoring tools on top of the scuba, which I just mentioned about. So for this one, it's about the task level metrics. Uh, so we, uh, we, uh, we collect the task level metrics into, and, real time, uh, and in real time dump it to the scuba data set. So this could be very, turn out to be very useful for the users to answer uh, questions uh, such as that, uh, how many jobs filled in the last hour due to the auto memory error? And or for example, um, is there any stragglers of the my job? Because the user could very easily see on a time series graph, like how many stragglers, stra stragglers are there in the, uh, in the job run? Or how long does a job take to get the resources? So sometimes the job is slow, not because itself, but because uh, it is blocked by other jobs. So the user could figure out the root cause more easily in real time by utilizing this tool. And also, for some of the critical jobs, user could very easily set up alerting and monitoring, uh, such as um, dashboard or more, uh, monitoring or alert. So if something goes wrong, they can receive the alert um, so that they can go to and fix it. And uh, with that, I have uh, just one minute left, and that concludes my talk. Here are some references about the Scuba, uh, which is a Facebook internal tool. It's on our uh, developer blog. You can um, go and look at it. And some um, Apache um, Spark skill. Uh, it's about the big pipeline we have been productionized uh, in Facebook. And with that, that concludes my talk. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to talk me, to me and set up. Okay, we've got time for a few questions for Gaoxiang and Sitel. Any questions? One here. Uh, hi. Yeah, thank you for the talk. So as I know, Facebook uh, has a lot of query engines, including Spark and uh, Presto and Hive. Probably also Hive, yeah. So when you do the performance tuning, you can choose each engine to tune. So in your experience, so which engine, when you do the tuning, you can get uh, a lot of benefits. Let's say if there's a priority, so which one to tune first, or which one you make a, a little tune, you can gain a lot. Just want to hear some experience. So that uh, 
like which one to tune actually depends on your work, use case and workload, what you want to achieve. So, and also the scale at which you are operating, right? So, if yeah, you from want, your experience, let's say inside the Facebook. So, what's your experience so, comparing this? Yeah, the, all the configuration parameters I mentioned are needed to be tuned to run Spark at the scale at which we operate. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions? Hi. Uh, you had a slide for that application uh, uh, tuning. Yes. So you had number of mappers and reducers. That's not related to Spark, right? Because Spark doesn't, you don't specify the number of mapper and reducers. Uh, so I think it's a general concept. It's a basically controls the number of parallelism, how okay. you split your data. Okay. So it's not a Spark specific uh, conflict, but we do that calculation during the query planning phase based on your input size. Okay. Yeah. So I guess this follows on from the last one. Um, is the map number of mappers and reducers, is that an analogous to the spark.sql.shuffle.partitions? Because that's by default at 200. So if you've got like a lot of data and you've got more than 200 cores, then half your cluster is going to sit there doing nothing. Right. So uh, the number of mappers, the number of reducer is equivalent to the SQL partition, which we are talking okay. about. And depending on the workload size, you have to, the, because the 200 is not probably an optimal number for a large workload. That's why we auto-tune it, depending on the input size. Because for, for that, I always wonder, because I usually just lazily at runtime just go number of cores times number of, number of instances. So at least if I've, if I've got uh, basically one core has something to do for that. But do you, I, I'm guessing, do, do you have any, do you, have, do, you just, do you have a similar thing? Or as you say, you, you, you do it based on the size of the data rather than the number of executors you have? So. So this one thing is like the number of cores is not really fixed. As I said, you are using the dynamic executor allocation and there are multiple jobs running on the cluster, right? So you don't know upfront how many tasks or executor you are gonna, you are gonna get. And also like even if you have, let's say, your infinite resource, you cannot just bump up the number of uh, reducers to infinite because then your shuffle service becomes the bottleneck or you are doing too much of disk IO. So tuning those becomes very important for the, uh, for the performance of the job. Cool, thanks. Okay guys, thank you very much. Please show your appreciation, thank you.